I'll start at the beginning, my name, Derek Redman, just in case you didn't know that. Um, retired athlete, used to run around in circles for a living. Um, and, uh, and just to sort of uh, give you a bit of an idea of what I did, I mean, lucky enough, uh, it wasn't luck really, but uh, I've been sort of a British champion five times, European champion, Commonwealth champion and world champion. Uh, mainly in the relay, but some in the four by f uh, same in the, in the 400 meters as well. And um, I've obviously been retired for, for, for many years now. Unfortunately, was forced into retirement after the Barcelona Olympics, where, as I like to say, I was beaten by my dad in the semi-final. Um, <laughs> the truth of the matter is, for those that don't know, I pulled a hamstring after 150 meters in the semi-final after winning the first two rounds, and then I decided to get up and carry on running to finish the race. And with 100 meters to go, my dad fought his way from the stands. Uh, took out a couple of security guards uh, en route and uh, helped me uh, across the line. Um, and I guess that's the thing that most people uh, remember me for. But I, I'm, I do talk about that at times, but I didn't want to share that particular uh, story with you in depth. The one I actually wanted to talk about, really, I felt was a bit more relevant to, to, you know, to why we're here and where we are, to be honest with you. Uh, and, and that was what took place in Tokyo in, in 1991. And uh, back in 1991, I was... Uh, about four stone lighter, a lot quicker, less grey, more hair. God, I wish those days would come back. Um, but I was obviously competing for, for Great Britain at those World Championships. And I was in my usual two events. I was in the individual 400 metres where I was expected to make the final and battle it out for a, for a medal in the final. And uh, in the relay, the British team, we was expected to make the final and win a silver medal. We was expected to finish the, uh, second. Which, you know, when you first look at it, oh, it looks quite good. But from a sportsman, and I'm, I'm sure there's a few sportsmen and women in here, you know that, yeah, second's okay, but it's not what you work for, it's not what you train for. And the only place we wanted to come, the British relay team, was first. But in order to do that, we've got to beat the Americans. And the Americans were the favourites for those world championships. The British team, we were ranked number two because we were the reigning world champions, reigning Olympic champions. We had the second fastest time in the world that year. And in fact, we had the second fastest time in history. So we were odds-on favourite for a silver medal. The favourites for the gold medal were the Americans. They were the reigning world champions, reigning Olympic champions, they had the fastest time in the, in, in the world, and they also held the world record. And if you add that to the fact that they'd never been beaten in a men's 4 by 400 metres relay, at world or Olympic level, for 57 years, you can understand why they were the favourites. We didn't give a monkeys. We wanted to go there, and in the words of Akabusi, kick some Yankee butt. If there's any Americans in here, I apologise. Because it won't get any better. But so we, in fact, if I remember rightly, Akabusi called it the Spank the Yanks tour. So um, that's a, are there any Americans in here? Because uh, I know there's one. There is one. Oh, there's a girl. There's three. Oh, well, I can't go red. You can, so I'm not worried about it. Anyway, I'm uh, not being rude, but that's uh, how it went. Uh, so we went to those championships wanting to win a gold medal. For the first time, we wanted to take on the Americans and beat them. But before we can get our hands on that gold medal, we've basically got two hurdles to get through. Hurdle number one, we've got to qualify from the heats into the final. That's the first job. Assuming we do that and do that well, the second job is once we're in the final, the only way to get a gold medal is to finish first. first. Exactly. You are awake. Just check it. <laughs> so, for the heats of the... Uh, well, actually, before I tell you about the heats, I'll tell you about the guys who are in the team. We take a squad of six guys, or all teams take a, a squad of six guys. It's called the 4x400, four but only four run, but you always take a couple of reserves with you. So our relay team, apart from me, consists of, and hopefully you'll know some of the names, some of the people will, maybe some of you won't, but the, the team consists of, uh, the first guy was a guy called John Regis. Anyone remember big John Regis? We called him Johnny Two Chest Regis. Big four barrel chest. He had a big barrel butt, but don't ever tell him I said that. Uh, the next one, or the blokes won't know who it is, all the women will, Roger Pretty Boy Black. Yeah, he was called Sex on Legs. We didn't nickname that, we used to call him a what? Oh no, it's too early for that. So anyway. <laughs> Uh, the next cat guy on the team, so you've got uh, John Regis, you've got Roger Black. The next guy on the team was a very quiet, unassuming guy that none of you will ever heard of, and that was a guy by the name of Chris Akabusi. Uh, okay, you have heard of him. So you've got Roger, you've got John, you've got Chris, you've also got myself, and there was two reserves. One by the name of Mark Richardson, who uh, unfortunately, like me, had to retire early and was forced into retirement because of injury. And in my humble opinion, I personally think the most talented 400 metre runner this country has ever seen but didn't really get a chance to, to show that because of all the injuries that he had. Personally, that's what I think. And the other guy in the team was a guy called Addy Maffey. Um, now, I don't know if anybody remembers the name Addy Maffey. Um, does anybody in here support Chelsea? No? Okay. Uh, oh, there is. Oh, there's a couple. Well, there's, there's one at the back there. 
I've been speaking for 18 years. You're the first two Chelsea sports that have been on the <laughs> But Andy Maffey, when he retired from athletics, got a job at Chelsea as their strength and conditioning coach. And uh, he saw them through a couple of FA Cup finals where they won at least one of them. Um, so he got himself into, into that sort of world. And he left Chelsea and ended up at Millwall, where he was weapons and special tactics expert or something like that. I can't remember what it was. And then he went to, I think, West Bromwich Albion, where I think he's still looking for a way out. I'm not sure what he's talking about. So we were the six guys that pretty much were given the job of getting the, 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 you know, the, getting the, hopefully, Great Britain a gold medal rather than the expected silver. So as I say, for the heats, we decided that Roger Black should have a rest from running in the heats. He had a fantastic world championships, and he'd actually beat me to the silver medal in the individual 400. So he'd won a silver, so he decided, Roger, you don't need to run in, uh, say, we, the coaches as well, you don't need to run in the heats. He'd had four hard races, a heat, a second round, a semi-final, and a final. Sit it out, son. Have a rest. Big John Regis wasn't a 400 metre runner. But we knew he had one good run in his legs over 400 metres a year. And we thought we would save that one run for the Believe You Me. He only had one run in his legs. Um, and we thought we would save that run for the final. Anybody knows about John, and there was a lot of people nodding heads, his main distance was 200 metres. The guy was phenomenal at 200 metres. 19.75 is his personal best for 200 metres. And for those of you that don't really follow athletics, you all understand running under 10 seconds for 100 metres is pretty quick. Well, you imagine running 10 seconds for 100 metres and then going for another 100 metres and running that also in under 10 seconds. That's what John, uh, the tank Regis, as he was sometimes uh, known, could actually do. So we knew this guy had the pure leg speed we needed in that relay squad. We needed someone with his pure 200 metre speed. So also, being a, a 200 metre runner, we'd leave him out. We'd rest him for the final. So it obviously left the four of us, myself, Akabusi, Richardson and Matthew, with the job of getting a British team from the heats into the final. Cut a long story short, we qualified no problem. There were four heats. It was the first two teams in each heat to go through to the final the following day, and we won it no problems. In fact, we were the fastest qualifiers for that final. So after the heat, the four of us jumped on a coach. It took us back, not our coach, a coach, um, that took us back to uh, the hotel where we were staying. And we met up with Roger, and we met up with John, and the six of us sat down that evening and had our evening meal together. Now, as you can imagine, the topic of conversation during that meal was pretty much what went on on the track earlier on in the day, and what we thought was going to happen in the final the following day. So we just sat there, eating our food, talking about, obviously, the Americans are qualified, Obviously, no surprises there. The Kenyans made the final. There was a little bit of surprise there. The French have been knocked out. Yes. Just the usual stuff that we would talk about the night before the final. I hope there's no French in there. I'm not doing well with my own <laughs> diplomatic relations. Right. Halfway through that meal, our coach and team manager come up to our table because they want to tell us all the information we need for the final the following day. So they tell us that uh, the, the final is tomorrow at 8 p.m. with the very last event. After us is the closing ceremony for the World Championships. We've been given lane number three. And then our coach explains that the four guys in the final is going to be me on the first leg, Akabusi on the second leg, John Regis will come in and run the third leg, and Roger Black will run the fourth leg. And I think the last remark was, good luck, guys, make sure you get plenty of sleep. And off they went. Now, we pretty much knew... But the four guys in the final was going to be me, Chris, John and Roger, because we're the four fastest guys over 400 metres in the country. It's a final, you're going to put your fastest team out. Obvious. We also knew the order was going to be me to Chris to John to Roger. Maybe not so obvious to you. And one of the, two of the questions I get asked a lot is, in a 4x4, four four, how do you pick who runs what order? And honestly, does it make any difference? Well, to answer the second question first, yes, it makes a massive difference. And the way that you pick your order at world and Olympic level is like this. You put your fastest man last, you put your second fastest man first, and the other two, you just chuck them in the middle. That is as technical as it gets at world and Olympic level. As long as you've got your fastest man last and your second fastest man first, technically and tactically, you've pretty much got it right. So Roger is now the fastest man in the country Silver medal in the individual, he beat me, hands down, no problem. He's obviously the fastest man in the country, he's going last. I'm now the second fastest man in the country, I'm going th uh, first. We've got Regis uh, running third, and we've got Akabusi running second. So we, we know the order, everyone's happy, job done. We finish our food, and we decide to go get an early night. We go up to our rooms, you've got Roger and Chris sharing a room. They had the same coach, so we're training partners, so they always room 
whenever he went away. John and I shared a room, and you've got Addy Mafia, Mark Richardson, the two reserves, sharing another room. John and I are now in our room, sitting there, just chilling out, watching a bit of TV. It's about nine, half nine, I can't remember what time it was. We're never going to sleep yet, our body's full of adrenaline. The final's not until 8pm the following day, so as long as we're getting some rest, we're quite happy. We're just sitting there still chatting about what's going to happen, all this sort of stuff. I don't know, by about 10 o'clock, there was a knock at the door. And I looked at John, I don't know, it went to the door, I opened the door, and it's Roger, and it's Chris. I said, what's up, guys? Roger says, we need to talk. So I said, okay, you better come in. So they came in, John mutes the TV, he says, what's up, guys? We need to have a conversation with you. So my first thought was, and I said this, I said, oh, please don't tell me one of you's got an injury. No, 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 nothing like that, don't worry. I said, okay, what is it? And Roger went, well, Chris, tell him what you told me. And we all looked at Chris. <laughs> And Chris has gone, oh, look, it's not that bad. You know what Roger's back like? He's, uh, uh, we used to call him Bambi because when he first broke on the scene, his legs used to buckle uh, as, as he used to race. He goes, oh, you know what Bambi's like? He's always, you know, it's not that bad. He said, but we've just been talking in our room and uh, we've worked out, you've got to remember, this is Chris speaking. He goes, we've just been talking in our room. We've worked out that we need to change the order. Okay. And um, what, what has become quite apparent between us, well, between me anyway, is I should run the last leg. And John and I look at each other and we looked at Chris and I said, the last leg? He said, yes. We said, why? Chris's individual event, and he explained this to us, his individual event was 400 meter hurdles. He was expected to finish seventh in that 400 meter hurdles final. With about 150 meters to go, guess what position he was in? Seventh. By the time he crossed the line, he crossed the line in third. Won a bronze medal in the four hurdles at the World Championships in 1991. Do you think he was happy? No. Absolutely pigged off with himself. Absolutely disappointed, distraught, gutted with his performance. And the reason that he was gutted is because Chris's usual tactics are, with about 130, 140 metres to go, Chris will put a kick in. His final kick to come you know, down the home straight. As he comes off, he kicks off the bend down the home straight. That's basically what he's doing. For some reason, unknown to Chris... When he got to that point, he decided, no, nah, I'm not going to kick. I'm going to wait till there's 100 metres to go. Because actually, at that point, he didn't actually believe that he had the strength to, to finish. He waited till he got to the 100 metre mark thereabouts, and then kicked. Went past everybody by the guys who finished first and second. And the sad thing is, if the race was five metres further, if it was a 405 metre race, he would have caught and passed the other two guys. Or... If he had kicked when he said he was going to kick, and when he usually kicks, he would have got himself a gold medal. So as much as he was happy to get a bronze medal, he was absolutely distraught <coughs> because that bronze could have and should have been a gold medal. And he explained this to us, and he said, guys, I didn't realise what shape I'm in. I underestimated how fast I'm running, how strong I am. I am in the shape of my life. There's only one place for me in this, in this race, and that's the last leg. You put me on that last leg... And give me a 10 metre lead would be fantastic. I know that's possibly not the way it's going to be. But you put me anywhere behind the final American within 10 metres and I'll bring us a gold medal. Within 10 metres, I'll have it. And we looked at Chris and we knew that this guy was, was deadly serious. For a start, he wasn't laughing. So we knew the guy was absolutely serious. So we said, OK, let's have a listen to that, Chris. That's, let's just have a think about that. So we're going to put you on the last leg. We'll take Roger off. Where's Roger going? And Chris said, I have no idea where anybody else is going, but I can tell you the best place for me is actually on the last leg. <coughs> Excuse me. So we had a bit of a laugh about that. And then Roger turned around and said, you know what, though, guys, all seriously, he's right. I think he should go on the last leg. And there's actually only one place for me in this race. And we said, where's that? We said, the first leg. So John and I now looked at each other thinking, they're having a laugh here. They're, they're definitely having a bit of a laugh here. So we said, the first leg. And John said, third leg. Why the first leg? And Roger explained. He said, I won a silver medal in the individual 400 metres. I said, thank you for rubbing that in. We know that. <laughs> he said, seriously, I won a silver medal in the individual 400. So technically, that makes me the second fastest man in the world over 400 metres. We said, yes. He said, I was beaten by an American, Antonio Pettigrew. Yeah. But we know the Americans are going to put Antonio on the last leg. We said, yeah. So he said, think about it. If I run the first leg... There's nobody else in the world that is going to be better than me. And when I've run my leg and hand the baton over, we will hand over in first place. Now, that possibly doesn't make... It might sound obvious to you guys. You don't think it makes any difference. But when you consider 
For the previous 57 years, regardless to the, the team the Americans put out, they win every gold medal. And the Americans only have one tactic, and it is simple. The gun goes, they get out in front. The first athlete will give them a lead. It's normally anywhere between 5 and 10 metres. They hand over to the second American, who extends that lead. By the time he's finished, they've got, Americans have got maybe a 15, 20 metre lead. They hand over to the third American, he extends that lead. So by the time the Americans give the baton to their final leg runner, who's usually someone of the calibre of Michael Johnson, they've got a 30 metre lead before we even start. Michael Johnson, with a 30 metre lead, is unbeatable unless you shoot him. <laughs> so if the Americans get this lead from the get-go, Normally, and going back in, in the way, historically, the race is over. Roger is suggesting that Great Britain be in the lead and see what the Americans are made of. So we said, you know what? Crazy as this sounds, it sounds like a brilliant idea. So again, to cut a bit of a long story short, we decided, yes, we're going to put Roger on the first, uh, on the first leg. Reed just really wanted to run the third leg. He got his head around what he was doing with this third leg. He'd been working, um, thinking about it for, you know, in his training, goodness knows what. He wanted to run the third leg and didn't particularly want to change that if he, he felt it would fit in. We said, yes, it will, no problem. So I said, well, look, I'll slot into the second leg. No choice, really, did I? But I, I said, I'll slot in and I'll run the second leg. So between the four of us, we've come up with this idea of completely changing the, the, the order of the relay team. We decide that that's what we're going to do and we're going to go and see the coaches and tell him in the morning. Akabu said, no, I ain't going to get any sleep tonight. We're going to see him now. It's now about midnight, by the way. So we call straight down to reception. Can you tell us what room Les Jones is in, our team manager? They tell us what room he is. We go and find him, knock on his door. Who is it? It's the relay team. Sorry? It's the relay team. Can we see him now? Yes, now. Opens his door. What do you guys want? We go in. We explain it to him. And actually, credit to Les, he turned around and said, listen, guys, if that's what you think is going to get you a gold medal... You've got my blessing. Uh, have you spoken to Frank? No, we're going to see him now. Why don't you see him in the morning? No, we've got to see him now. Do you know what room is in? No, can we borrow your phone? Reception? Can you tell us where Frank Dick's room is, please? Yeah, they tell us room. We go and see Frank. Tell him the whole thing. Frank is like, ooh, I don't know. Don't know, guys. Don't know. You know, let's stick to what we know. This is, it's, a, it's a nice idea. Great way of thinking. Let's maybe think about that for the Olympic Games next year. No, 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 no. We're here now. This is, we've got a chance of winning this, but this is what we want to do. Yeah, but no, John, you know, you just slipped in, you start on the third, Derek, you, you know, between you, go, you run the first leg, you know, you guys are always running between you and Roger first and last leg, stick to that. Roger, you stay on the luck. No, we don't want to know. And we had a bit of a discussion with Frank that ended up with us saying, you're either gonna, we're either going to run this order with your blessing or we're going to run it without your blessing, but we're running the order that we want. And uh, under a bit of pressure, Frank actually turned around and said, it's okay, you can run that order, but on your heads be it. And that was the coach of our relay team. And his parting words as we left was, on your heads be it. So thanks for the confidence, coach. So we left and we went back to our rooms and finally went back to bed, got a good night's sleep, woke up the next day and it's the big day of the final. And a uh, couple of things, actually, I, I will mention that happens uh, at a major championship. I don't know if anybody was lucky enough to get down to the London Olympics at all but, uh, and see any athletics if you, if you did. But for those that, that didn't and don't know this, when you compete either at a World Championships or Olympic Games, um, there's always two athletic tracks. So there's the main stadium where all the action happens, what you watch on TV, and somewhere pretty close to it is a warm-up track. It's a full-size track, there's no stadium around it or anything like that, but it's a full 400-metre track. And that's where you go down doing all your warming up and all your preparations before you go and compete. And obviously, you go and warm up and you prepare for your race as, as you would in any, any, any sport. But in, uh, again, uh, the, uh, the second thing I'm, uh, then I'm going to tell you is at an Olympic Games or World Championships, you have to be warmed up and ready to race and finish your warmed up an hour before your race is due to start. So our final is at 8 p.m. By 7 p.m., we've got to be completely warmed up and ready to race. 7 o'clock, you hear an announcement asking for all the teams to go and report for, in our case, the relay to, uh, 4 by 400 meters final. And in the middle of the track were three tents, so more like small marquees. Tent A, Tent B, and Tent C. We've just been asked now to go and report to Tent A. One hour to go before your race. Physically, if you're not in shape at 7 o'clock, Actually, there's not much you can do to get yourself in shape by 8 o'clock. You can't go for an extra run. You can't go to the gym. There's not much you can do to physically change the shape you are in at 7 o'clock. Maybe drink a lot of alcohol. That will change your physical state. But 
it isn't going to improve it, believe you me. Uh, you can try the Ben Johnson and Dwayne Chambers diet too, but it doesn't work in an hour. Um, so there's not much that you can do, think about it, there's not much that you can do physically at 7 o'clock to change your shape by 8 o'clock. The shape you're in is pretty much the shape you're going to be in at 8 o'clock. But mentally, it's talking about a completely different game. If you're not quite in shape at 7 o'clock, what do I mean by mentally being in shape? I'm on about being focused, I'm on about being in the zone, uh, knowing what you're going to be doing, um, feeling confident, uh, knowing exactly what's expected of you. That's what I'm talking about, being mentally in shape. So if you're in mental, mentally, you're in shape and ready to go at 7 o'clock, by 8 o'clock, you can start to lose that. Likewise, if you're not quite there at 7 o'clock, you've still got an hour to mentally get yourself in shape by eight o'clock. So what I'm basically saying is an hour to go before any major competition, any major race, not just in athletics, in any sport. Actually, it's not a physical thing. It's 100% a mental game. All the physical stuff's been done in training years, months, weeks, even days ago. We're now down to what's going on between years. So we've been in this position many a time before, the British Relay team, and we decided, you know what? We're not going to the tent yet. We're going to wait a bit. We're not going to turn up at the tent at 7 o'clock. We're going to wait till about 10 past 7 and start playing our mental games with the guys. So we turned up at the, uh, the tent at 7 o'clock. I won't bore you with what goes on in the tent, but generally it's, you, you know, they get you to collect there uh, nice and early uh, and they go for a series of checks. You get your numbers and everything that goes on. They check all your kit and they do a lot of housekeeping stuff. Once everything's been done to all the athletes in all the teams, it's about quarter to 8 and you're still stuck in a warm-up tent that, believe you me, doesn't smell very good because there's some nervous oh. athletes in this tent, <laughs> if you get my drift. We finally get told we can come out of the, uh, the warm-up track and we are literally transported from the warm-up track to the main stadium. We arrive at the main stadium, we get off this little uh, bus that we were on, this coach, and we're escorted from there into the stadium through some corridors and tunnels until we get to the main tunnel that leads you out onto the track. And you know you're there because the surface of this tunnel is exactly the same surface as the track and there's other athletes doing some strides, warming up, doing their drills, whatever, before they go out and compete. And we turn up, we sit down in one corner, trainers off, spikes on, and we're waiting to go out onto the track. We're not allowed on the track yet because there's an event going on and there's some track referees stopping you from going out of the tunnel. Once that race is done and dusted, the athletes have come in, we get told we can go out. All the guys go out and they either do a run around the first bend or they do a run up the 100 metre home straight, the wrong way around and uh, all come back down. The guys who are running first lane are busy setting up their starting blocks. We're all doing our final minutes preparation. With one minute to go, the track referee will uh, blow a whistle to tell you there's one minute to go. 30 seconds later, he blows another whistle that tells you there's 30 seconds to go. At that point, we all came back into the tunnel and uh, we all kind of just got into a huddle, four of us, arms around each other, and we just looked at each other, literally just looked at each other in the eyes. And there was silence for about 10 seconds. Not a word between the four of us. The only person who said something was Akabusi. And he just, typical, he, put, he just turned around and said, let's go and claim what's ours. That's all he said. Let's go and claim what's ours, guys. And we just looked at each other, big squeezing, and we all broke away. Simple words, but it was enough to get us going. Roger was running the first leg, so he stripped off, tracked suit and everything off, chucked it on his bag, he's pumped up, psyched up, ready to go, storms out and stands behind his blocks in lane number three. He's going to run a complete lap and hand the baton on to me. So myself and all the second leg runners, we're all stripped off, and we're on the inside of lane one, pretty much where the high jump takes place, waiting to walk onto the track once the first leg runners are start. The guys who are running third and fourth, they're back in the tunnel looking out onto the track, maybe stripped off to their T-shirts or whatever, uh, depending on how warm it is now they're feeling, and they're waiting for the race to start because they don't need to come out onto the track until it's their leg. So I'm in the infield of all the other second leg runners, all the first leg runners are out on the track, all the third and fourth are just looking at the race, just on, on the, near the tunnel. Start comes out, crowd goes quiet because they can sense a race is about to start. Uh, and I have to mention actually, because it's, uh, it's, it's quite, a, for me, it's a, it's a good fact. Those World Championships was the biggest crowd I've ever competed in front of, 110,000 people, even bigger than any of the two Olympics I competed in. 110,000 people in one stand. That's a massive, massive crowd to run in front of. And believe you me, when they start shouting and making some noise, it is deafening. So they've gone deadly quiet because the race is about to start. And the starter comes out, they've gone quiet, and the starter raises the starter piss and says, on your marks. All the athletes on the track shake their legs, do all their usual stuff, whatever they do, 
pray to mum, Allah, whatever, all these sort of people get into their blocks. And they're backing into their starting blocks, making sure they're in the right position. There's track referees that's come onto the track now to make sure they've all got their fingers behind the line. Once they have, they signal to the starter and the track referees disappear. You've now got 110,000 people who are dead quiet. You've got eight guys in their starting blocks that are on their marks. And you've got the rest of their, their relay team just watching and waiting for them to start. I'm in the infield, just sort of shaking my legs, bumping shoulders with the other second leg runners, treading on their toes, the usual tactics. <laughs> of this and all I'm doing is looking at Roger. That's all I'm doing, looking at Roger. And I'm actually saying, come on, Roger, let's go. Good start, son. Let's go, let's go. And I'm actually talking to him. You can't hear me. I'm psyching myself up more than anything else. The starter says, yeah, set. They all get into the set position. Deadly silence. And then two or three seconds later, bang, the gun goes. And I think I'll play this. The stadium quiets. The athletes walk forward and settle on their marks. We don't need him. He's all right now. The World Championship final of the 4 by 400 metres relay. So the Americans are in lane five. Great Britain are in lane three. Four. As they get away, and Roger Black in lane number three goes straight away, closes right down the Jamaican. The American valve on the starting fast as well. Into the back straight, though, as Black at this stage has cut right back on the Jamaican Pat O'Connor. Also going well as Bell, one of America, and right on the outside, Kitter Kenya. The first leg of running lanes, and the first bend of the second leg, and then they can break. The stagger and wind, we begin to see how they sort it out. The important point is the breaking point on the second leg at the beginning of the back straight. Black is running good one, but so too is Balman. But Black uh, on the inside is closing him down all the time. And the handoff point, while it's very close to being America and Great Britain, well, I think Great Britain has just got the edge. Derek Redman now, the UK record holder from Birchfield on the second leg. <laughs> when she was going for America. Black 44-6 on the first leg, that's a run. And Britain got the lead they wanted. They've now got to start increasing it because they've got to give Akabusi a healthy start on the anchor leg. Derek Redman being chased by the teenage Quincy Watts and called by the American. But has Redman saved something? That's it down the straight. It's a brilliant leg by the American youngster. It was a brilliant leg by the British Quincy youngster Watts too. has got America right back in and has the British gamble failed? John Reed is on the third leg, and he's chasing Danny Everett. The time for Redmond, 44 watts. So Watts ran a storm. I ran a storm. <laughs> <laughs> right behind the world championship. I don't know who he's standard. working for, I really don't. Everett. When will Regis attack? Has he got the ability to attack? A season 400 meter runner. Regis comparatively inexperienced. And Everett stretching slightly away. Regis comes wide to have a go. And Regis can't quite get there. America will take over in the lead with their world champion pedigree on the anchor leg. Akabusi goes after him. The difference is three meters. Now Akabusi has got to sit there and wait and wait and make a late attack if he can. But he's up against the man who is the world champion. The race between the two of them. And the leg by reach is 44.3. And still Akabusi waits. Petty Crew with gold behind him in the individual event. Akabusi, bronze in the corner hurdles. <laughs> Here he goes. This is an important point. Can Akabusi do it? Akabusi has a go. And the American is there. And he's fighting back. Akabusi has made it. One of these days I'm going to watch that race and we're not going to win it, I tell you. But tonight we do. Um, uh, sorry Americans that are in the room. Should we play it again? No. Um, unbelievable. Couldn't believe that we actually uh, won that race. Uh, our plan actually worked. You know, what we set out to do, it, it, it came true. It worked. And I'm going to tell you a funny story actually. Uh, I think Mike's heard this before. One of the things that happens after you run your leg in a relay race, you don't see the next relay leg because you're knackered. So what happens is Roger will run his leg, he'll hand the baton on to me, and then he'll assume the position. <laughs> He's absolutely knackered. 
it will take, you know, world class 400 meter runner, generally somewhere between 30 seconds to 60 seconds to recover. We're running at 44 second pace, so there's a good chance you're not going to see the, the, the bulk of it. You might just get up and walk and just see the other athlete, but you've had the baton on coming down the home straight. So Roger doesn't see my leg, I take the baton, I do mine, I don't then see John's leg, because I'm assuming the position, I get up, finish. John comes in, now remember he doesn't recover very well from 400, and he is literally blowing out of every orifice of the cod cave here. And he assumes a position, which for John is more on one knee, and he's down on one knee, and you've got to look after John. So I'm there trying to look after him, getting some water, pouring his head, it's really hot out there in Tokyo, trying to get him to get up and say, come on John, get up and walk, and we're trying to get him to walk around. He's in a bad way. He's in a bad way. So we get him to walk and you think, yes, he's recovering. Then he's back down again like this. I haven't watched right, so I'm trying to look what's going on. He manages to ask me, what's happening? Uh, wants to know what's going on in the race. So I'm now trying to look after John and also commentate what's going on in the race. By this point, there's about 150, maybe 200 metres to go. And I've gone, sorry, the 200 metre mark. Um, uh, Akabus is three metres, two metres behind Pedigree. Yeah, he's going all right again. Are you all right? Do some more water? Yeah, 150, still the same. Still two metres behind. Yeah, they're coming up to 100 metre mark. Yeah, 100 to go. Right, 80 metres to go. He's pulling wide. And now I've, got, I've kind of got John to go. He's pulling wide. Yeah, he's... Prump. Yeah, he's, uh, he's, he's there. <laughs> he's coming down. He's coming down this way. We're going to do it. We've done it, Regis. We've done it. We've done it. And I've got him. John's still on the floor. And I've just legged it onto the track. Jumped all over Chris, Roger's come running in, we're all going, oh yeah, giving it all this sort of stuff, and that's it, the crowd are going wide and we're waving, we've started on our victory lap. <laughs> and we've gone, yeah, high five, high five, high, hang on a minute, because we're missing. John is still on the infill, <laughs> like this. So we're going, because his nickname, his nickname is Tank, so we just go, Tank, come on, we've won, Regis, Teachers, come on, we've won. And he's just, Regis. We've just won the world championship, come on! And the only thing John could do was go... What's <laughs> 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 one has to be like, oh, God! So we have to go back and actually pick him up and start him on his victory lap. And do you know what John's first words were? Please, God, don't make me run a lap again. <laughs> it didn't take you very long once you realised we are world champions. It's amazing. Once you find out you're world champion, a spring in your step sort of comes along. Um, but one of the, uh, the other things that happened in that race is... Um, one of the Americans, I think it was Quincy Watts, as, re, as, as Akabusi went over the line, said something. And I'm going to change a few of the words. But it was something along the lines of, damn, how the flip did that happen? And uh, very crudely put, but it was a, a good question. You know, how did that happen? Now, for most of you, you possibly don't know what I'm doing now, what my role is. I actually also work for, uh, for Thomas International. Um, uh, my role is a uh, group performance director. Don't ask me what I do because I don't know really. Um, and obviously, for those of you that don't know what Thomas International do uh, as, uh, as a business, we're a company that supplies and, and carries out people assessments, uh, psychometric uh, uh, assessments on, on, on people, sorry. Uh, and we kind of look what's going on inside of you. And one of the things that uh, I've been doing for many years is speaking around the world to companies about teamwork and about getting teams that work well together. And actually, one of the biggest ingredients that I was missing was, if you like, the ability to, to, to show what the relay team had that what made them really successful. And the reason I was missing that, because at the time, I knew nothing about what Thomas did as a, as a company. And actually, the only reason I'm here is because I met Mike at an event I was speaking at. He um, had me assessed, and the results blew me away. Could not believe that how, from doing such a simple online eight-minute test, this person who I didn't know at the end of the phone was telling me about my character, about my traits, about me, that only three people in this world really knew. My dad, my coach, and God bless her, my wife. There are only three people that know me inside out of those three people. And I feel sorry for all three of them, really, especially my wife. And there I am on the phone to this person. Um, I'm in Northampton. They're in Marlow, and they're talking, and talking to me. I put the phone on speakerphone, and I said to my wife, you've got to come and listen to this, because I can't believe what this person's saying down here. And it was on the phone for maybe 45 minutes or so, and it came off the phone. And I said, what do you think that? And my wife said, I can't believe that. I said, why? She goes, because if I didn't know you any better, I would say you're married to her as well because that's how close we got it. 
So I've got a slide up there that says, so, was it all down to pure luck what we did in that relay team? And the obvious answer is, yeah, you just picked the audience now. Actually, it wasn't. A couple of facts about that race. The Americans were 3.09 seconds quicker than the British team. Doesn't really sound a lot. One, two, three, point zero nine. Doesn't sound a lot. But when you work out that if you run 400 metres in 44 seconds, you will cover nine metres in one second. So if we're three seconds slower than the Americans, and we're running at a rate of nine metres per second, they've got an advantage over us of 27 metres. All four Americans were quicker than all four British guys. But we beat them by a couple of hundredths of a second. It's not a lot, but when we should have been 27 metres slower than them, to beat them by, I don't know, a couple of centimetres, that's a massive deficit that we've made up. 27 plus metres we made up in one race. And how was that done? Was that down to luck? It really, really wasn't down to luck. And I'm, I'm going to switch a little bit and talk about what one of, the, uh, one of the assessments that we do, which is called a PPA, Personal Profile Analysis. And it looks at your, your traits. How can I put it another way that you might understand? Your personality, the way that you act, and why you do the things you do. And really for you guys to understand, I need to just maybe spend a few minutes explaining what a PPA is. Um, what a personal profile is, how does it come about, what does it go on. So, where to start? In, in the 1920s, I'm going back for when Mike was a young boy, uh, in the 1920s, there was a psychologist called William Marsden, and he used to do, he did a study on normal people. You had people like Freud that were doing studies on weirdos, murderers, and goodness knows what, and he could tell us all about them, but nobody was looking at normal people. And Marsden decided, oh, I'm going to just look at normal people. And he concluded that normal people see the world in one of two ways. Either a hostile place or a friendly place. That was it. That's how we saw the world. And we react in that world in one of two ways. Either we, we, act, we react with, actively or passively. That was basically what he, he, he sort of came up with. By the way, William Marsden invented two things that you all know. The first one was the lie detector, and the second one was Wonder Woman. He actually came up with the character of Wonder Woman. Don't ask me what he was thinking, but of lie detector and Wonder Woman, I don't, I don't know. But that's what this was. So, using the lie detector more as an example, this guy can understand the way that people think because the lie detector is still used. I think he designed it for the invented it for the CIA, if, if I, my memory serves. 1927. There you go. You remember it, don't you? And uh, so this guy knows how people work. He concluded that we all show four particular traits, but we show them in different amounts. And I want to go through those because it's quite important to, to go back to that relay thing. So if you see the if you see the world at a hostile place, but you're an active person, then you saw <laughs> the world as you, 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 well, sorry, one of the traits that you, you demonstrate was that of dominance. Okay, just remember the word. I'll come back with a little bit of explanation on those. <coughs> if you see the world friendly, but it, but it still was active, you saw that you, you, you demonstrate a lot of traits of influence. If you see it from a passive point of view, but friendly, steadiness. And from a hostile point of view, but you as passive, compliance. So, dominance, influence, steadiness, and compliance. It's called the DISC theory, which some of you may or, or may not have, 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 have heard of. It's called the DISC theory. So, what do I mean by dominance? Um, uh, the best kind of uh, demonstration to use, I think, uh, and someone used would be, is celebrity chefs. So, when we talk about dominance, we're talking about someone who is, you know, very forward. They would tell you what to do. Who is a celebrity chef, would you say, is someone who wouldn't ask you to do something, it will tell you to do it in no uncertain terms, and went effer blind about it? Gordon Ramsay. Typical, typical person who we'd say has a lot of dominance. Okay? So, basic fear is failure. Gordon Ramsay doesn't want people to fail, doesn't like people to fail. Uh, they're motivated by power and authority. And actually, if you want to look at what their value to an organisation would be, it would be driving for results. Gordon Ramsay wants you to get it right. He's going to hammer you until you get it right. Good explanation or not of, of Gordon Ramsay? Yeah? So now we're going to think of a, a celebrity chef who you would say is more of an influencer. 
Who is someone who's a bit of a cheeky chappy? Yeah, and that laughs and smiles and wants to joke and a bit more friendly with it. Jamie, Jamie Oliver. I'm glad you got that right. Thank you. Jamie Oliver. So if we look at people with basic fear is rejection. So they don't like to be rejected. So Jamie is really nice. He wants you to like his, his cooking, his style, his whatever he's doing, and his uh, you know, cheeky chappy type thing because he wants you to get on. He doesn't want any sort of conflict with you. Motivated by public praise and recognition, so he likes to say, yeah, that's a good job. Yeah, thanks, mate. Thanks, pal. Everybody's matey-pally, that sort of thing. And if you all look at value to an organisation, they love to work and through people. Jamie Oliver is someone who likes to be involved. Gordon Ramsay, if he could cook with a load of people that weren't there, he would. Because as far as he's concerned, he's the best there is and no one can beat him. Or no one's better than him. Whereas Jamie, ah, no, come on, let's all do this together. Wants everybody to kind of get involved. So then we come on to steadiness. Who is a chef that you think, you might have to go back a few years, not that many, um, but is someone who's pretty steady, pretty much goes under the radar, you don't really see much of her, but very good at what she does, and almost was the pioneer of all these celebrity chefs. Delia Smith. Smith. So Delia Smith is someone who we would say, you know, again, basic fears of insecurity, we don't need to go much as, likes, you know, security and things, so she's not bothered about being, you know, master chef or this or that, she's got a... A steady ways of doing things, and she likes to do what she does and the way that she does it. And again, the value of an organisation would be service support specialists. And this is someone who's put a lot into the celebrity cooking world, is someone like Delia Smith. And then the last one, compliance. I'm going to put up the bits first. Basic fear, conflict, I want to argue with people. Motivated, motivated by what we call standard proceed, uh, proceed, operating procedures. In other words, they like to do things by the book. They want to make sure that they unturn every stone. They want to do everything right. They get into their cooking. They look at it more from a scientific point of view. Anybody come to mind? Heston. 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 You've heard this before, haven't you? <laughs> Heston Blumenthal. Blumenthal, Blumenthal, Blumenthal. Heston. Um, he is definitely what we would say, a person who's got a, a, got a high C. Um, very technical. Love. Everything's got to be just right or it's not going out of the kitchen. Does all, I don't know if you've ever watched any of his shows, he does some unbelievable things, some scientific things with his food. That's someone who is a high C. Now, we all show these traits in different amounts. One of the things that I have now learned, because we didn't have psychometric assessments back when I was competing, I have since tested uh, um, um, and assessed all the relay team. And I won't bore you with all the results, but when you look at the results, it's not obvious of the performance that we got. It's not obvious we did what we did. Not what we did on the track, what we did off the track, the night before the race. The fact that Chris came to our room and was able to get across in his way what he felt we should do. We all sat down and listened, and we made the actual changes that actually took us from being a world-class relay team to being the world's best. And the interesting thing about it is actually when you look at it, it was a very small thing that we did we just changed the order around. We didn't actually say, right, you three are out, you three are in. It was the same guys, and we just swapped them around. And a small difference had a massive result. And it took us from being the second best in the world to being world champion. And I have spent years trying to talk to organisations and companies about teamwork and what we did, and it was almost like, well, yeah, we were just lucky to have the right four people, the right attitude, and boom. There's much more to it. There is actually a science behind what we did, how we did it, and how we executed it. Of course we had to be in shape. Of course we had to go and do the business and execute what we said we were going to do. But we knew we could do that anyway. We was in shape. But the fact that of all our characteristics, and when I look back at it now, when Chris came in, who has got a lot of what we call D in his profile and a lot of I, he came, yeah, we're going to change the order. That's it. I'm going to run the last leg, and that's going to be it. You've got Roger, who's a very high C. He went, hold on a minute. Let's just work this out. If you were that 24, 27, 20, let's work this out, yeah, but that might be, well, I don't know. He was more technical about it and was thinking about it. Whereas the likes of myself and Chris, we were just going to go in there and do it. We wouldn't even think about it. Because our traits and our characteristics, that's what we were. But we needed a bit of a balance of everything. So actually, we needed that, Roger, to say, hold on. Before you go and do that, let's just think about the consequences and let's work out all the scenarios and all the ways that this could happen. And Roger ran the race 25 times in his head in different ways to make sure that that was the best and ended up coming up with the same conclusion Chris thought of in two seconds. But that's the way he works. 
People would say, oh my God, oh God, he's anal. Oh my God, that person's a geek. Oh my God, actually it isn't. It's a trait that, that they have. So why have I said that? Because actually, I'll ask another question. How does it relate to you guys? And I'm talking now, uh, if you like, with a, with a further education, a university uh, hat on. How can that kind of work with, with you guys? Well, what we're actually doing with the university here, which is actually, I think, quite brave and, and quite forward thinking, is we're working with the university and we actually are testing a lot of the students. And um, one of the areas that uh, has come up in, in, in conversation uh, 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 quite a lot is this word, employability. And it's one of the areas that it's not just, uh, unfortunately, it's just not a problem or an issue or a concern or a challenge, whichever word you want to use with this university, it's pretty much across the country. What is a definition? What do we mean by employability? I've got a quote up here, which I'll let you guys read. I won't bother <coughs> reading it. You guys can read it. So... We're talking about employability. We're talking about students that graduate. They get a degree to whatever level they do. They get themselves a degree and they want to get out in the big bad world and hopefully land a, you know, a reasonable job. What are the challenges they have trying to do that? Number one, there's always lack of opportunities out there. There seems to be lack of opportunities. There seems to be that situation where sometimes you can get a job but we're not going to pay you. Internship, as they call it in America, don't they? Um, you know, you could, you, you know, your internship. That seems to be happening a lot over here now. Yeah, we can do something, but we're not going to pay you. And the other one is actually, you're too inex inexperienced for the position. <coughs> I'm just going to put that quote back up on again, but this time, I've actually highlighted a few of the words. <coughs> and the words that I've highlighted, obviously, are the ones in green, is what I want you to concentrate on. I am a massive believer that sports can set you up for whatever you do in life. There is a massive link between sport and business. I have a presentation called business is, Sport is a Business and Business is a Sport. It's no different through the world of education. The mind of a successful sports person is that no different to the mind of a successful business person. There is no difference. There's no difference between business and sport. The only difference between sport and business is the actual activity you're taking part in. Because we all have competitors. We all hopefully or should train for our work. There's no guarantees we're always going to stay on top. We always start at one level and work our way up. In some cases you can stay there, and in some cases you can come back there. Am I talking about sport or am I talking about business? I'm talking about them both. And it's no difference in the world of education. Because we educate ourselves, hopefully, so we can get into that business world in a nice, fluent transition and get ourselves into a job and carry on through, through, you know, through, through our business lives. What sport did for me, it gave not just me and the relay guys, it gave me the skills, the understanding, and the personal attributes to do what I did well. Not just me, and the rest of the relay team. And if you read it here, that makes graduates, in this case, more likely to gain employment and be successful. And it was no different for us. <laughs> Going back to the, to the, to the athletic as well, all those things, all those traits, the skills, the understanding, and knowing the personal attributes of my fellow team, member, net, uh, team members, made us more successful. And I'm hoping I've explained this right and you're beginning to see the links of what I did as a sportsman, what you guys can do in your education, and what actually, not only in the world of education, obviously in the world of business, can actually make you achieve things that you didn't think possible. And sometimes our success doesn't come down just to us and understanding ourselves, or thinking we're understanding ourselves, it's understanding other people. It could be something as simple as your tutors understanding how you work. How you tick. I'm trying to use word, layman's words here that, we all, you know, that you will all understand. I don't want to kind of get into our jargon. You know, if someone doesn't understand you, doesn't understand the way you tick, it's hard for them to communicate and, 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 and get you to react the way that you want to. Again, in the world of sport, when I was being coached, I had a coach. Again, we didn't have these tools. But I had a coach who, could under, who had a knack of... May have been luck, but he could understand how to coach. He was a good coach because he knew how to talk to each athlete individually. There was a whole group of us, sprinters, 400 meter runners. Some athletes, like me, <clears throat> he could say to me, tonight, Derek, we've got six 300s, three minutes recovery, I want them all under 38 seconds. Okay, Tony, I'll go off and do them. Other athletes say, you've got six 300s, 
Uh, through discovery, I'm going to under 38 seconds. I'm going to be there. I'm going to be on your shoulder shouting at you. And as they did the run, he would be hollering down their necks, shouting, cheering them on, telling them about their mother, all sorts of stuff to get them to run the six, leg, the six runs in the time that he wanted. Didn't need to do that with me. If my coach started doing that to me, it, it, oh, it was the worst thing. I'd actually stop the run and say, Tony, shut up. I know what I'm doing and I could get on and do it. So he was skinning the cat in two different ways. He was getting the same result but taking two completely different approaches with two completely different athletes because we are two different human beings. And it's one of the things that uh, I have learned uh, in my short time with Thomas. I've only been at Thomas since October the 1st. Um, I uh, started part-time and on April the 1st, and I didn't know whether these guys were joking or not, they made me full-time. I, I was hoping 12 o'clock come, please don't say you've got to go, you've got to go before 12 o'clock, but they didn't and I'm still here for some reason. So it's all relatively with me, but it's, it is unbelievable the work that we're doing, not only in the world of business, but not only in the world of sport, but also in the world of education, where this is having some great effects. And I wanted to share that fact with you, because I did just want to come up here and talk about the good old days, and I was the best, and this and that, and all that sort of stuff, because I think there is some relevance of why we were here today to meet with the, um, the guys from, uh, from the university and talk about what's happening in the future. And they, like most institutions, have some challenges, and hopefully we can help alleviate some of those, some of those challenges. So that's pretty much what I wanted to, to share with you guys. Um, we have lots of other products that we do. That was only one, but I just wanted to give you an idea of what Thomas does as a business. It's all about people. It's all about people's assessments and actually changing people's lives. And I could stand here and talk about uh, and give you lots of examples, not only, say, in the world of um, education, but also in the world of sport, and actually in, in the world of business, of how we have helped and, and managed to change other people. So when I look back at what we did back in 1991, to go back to that question, was it down to luck? No, it wasn't. I may have not known at the time, but we're saying earlier this year we profiled the girls. They've all seen their results, and they were like, God, yeah. And we've actually spoken about it and said, that was a major factor to why we did what we did. It was one of the best days of my, uh, my, my athletics uh, life. Uh, one of the worst days, again, which was sort of uh, brought up uh, in, in the introduction, was unfortunately Barcelona. I was expected to, to win a gold or a silver. I'd won the first two rounds. I was the fastest qualifier in the first round. Uh, I think the second fastest qualifier in the, in the second round. And then, as they pulled a hamstring in the, in, in the semi-final. But I had to retire from athletics uh, pretty much uh, after that, and I know I've run out of time, but just a very quick story, just to give you an idea of my, uh, the way that I tick and the way that I operate and the traits that I have. Uh, after the, I pulled a hamstring, which is a basic injury actually in athletics, just tore a few muscles in my hamstring, and they basically had a drink, no problem. The problem for me was, I didn't stay down. I actually got back up and tried to finish the race. By doing that, I made the injury worse, and I actually pulled the muscle away from the bone at the, at the insertion, which was the bad bit. And it was that that I needed to get operated on. So I flew back home a couple of days after the semi-final. In fact, the day of the final. Uh, I was on the plane as the final was, was taking place, so I didn't see it. Uh, I've still, to this day, never watched the final uh, of, the, of the 400 metres. Um, had my leg operated on. I had to take about six weeks off. Got back into training. Within two weeks, the hamstring went again. Uh, in the same spot, I had to go back into hospital. They cut me <coughs> open, stitched me up, and sewed me back up again. Rest. Back into training. A few weeks later, it went again. It happened seven times in, a, in an 18 month period. And I went to see a surgeon who had done all seven operations and it was him that gave me the news of that. Uh, well, in his words, it was something along the lines of, your hamstring's finished. It's never gonna be the same again. You're never gonna uh, be a professional athlete. You're never gonna compete for your country again. So go and get yourself a real job. That was his words. And him telling me about not competing as an athlete again or being a professional athlete didn't bug me. The one thing that bugged me was him telling me I'd never compete for my country again. That really, really got under my skin. So uh, I ended up going back to the States because I, I went to University in America, I went to UCLA. Um, a lot of friends out there, I had an apartment out there, so I went back out there and spent some time out there and I just recovered. I didn't do any running, I did a lot of training, got myself in great shape, but I played a lot of basketball, a hell of a lot of basketball. Came back to the UK and thought, I'm going to just play some basketball. Just, I don't know what I'm going to do with the rest of my life. 
but I'm going to play some ball. So I ended up joining a local team in Northampton, playing some basketball. I got scouted to go and play for the Birmingham Bullocks. I then got asked to come and try out for England for one international, a B international, and I ended up getting selected, playing as international. England won the game. I didn't get on off the bench until the second half tour, about 64 points in front. So even the coach knew I couldn't lose this game for us. Got on, ran up and down like an idiot, cheering, all this stuff. Finished the game, fantastic. A couple of photographers I knew, and I said, will you do me a favour, please? Can you send me some photos? This may not ever happen again, uh, but you know, I want some memories of this. Of course I will, Jay. Sent me some photos. I found the best shot. And I thought, I'm not going to do this. I'm going to put it on the frame. I'm going to put it on my wall. I thought, nah, no. So I got myself, a, they call them now, Sharpies in my day, magic marker. And I signed it to Dr. Cobb. <laughs> Thank you for your confidence. <laughs> signed Derek Redmond, international athlete and international basketball player. And I posted it to the same surgeon who told me he'd never compete for my country again. About a month later, I get a letter from him saying, oh, fantastic, I knew you were going to do that. I <laughs> thought that would spur you on. <laughs> yeah, whatever, whatever. Um, do you know what I did after that? Quit basketball. Literally, a week later, gave up basketball. And the reason I gave up, because I thought, you know what? This competing for your country life is easy. I've done it in athletics, I've done it in basketball. <laughs> Quite a few people have done it in two sports, no one's ever done it in three. So my next quest was to try and do it in a third sport. What other sport do I like? Rugby. Took the same path as I did in basketball. Started playing just local league, then got scouted to go and play for Coventry Rugby Club, which was professional, and then I knew I wasn't going to make the 15s, but I thought the sevens was where I could maybe, you know, do my stuff with a bit of speed that I've got left, and my hamstring was, seemed to be okay. I made it to the England Rugby Trial 7s, but alas, I didn't, uh, didn't make it into the, uh, the team, but it wasn't for the want of trying. So I've actually been professional in three sports, but only competed for my country in two. I know. What's he thinking of you, though? Um, but, you know, it's just the way that I am. I mean, if I get involved in a sport, I never particularly like to give up. Um, you mentioned motorbikes earlier on. So in, in 2006, I wanted to learn to ride a bike. The old bucket list. I don't know if anyone's seen the film. You know, uh, the, things, the list of things you want to do before you kick the bucket. One of them was for me to learn to ride a bike. 2006, I took my test. I passed February the 16th, 15th, 2006. A week later, funny enough, I bought a bike from Harrogate, from a dealer in, in Harrogate. Kawasaki 636. And I got a mate to drive me up. And it's Kawasaki, if anybody's into bikes, they're famous for their bright green bikes. So I've got these bright green and black levers on, and I walk into the shop with this helmet. Hello, I've come to buy that. <laughs> and we do the deal, and I get on it, and I start to ride back home. I stop at every service station on the way home, because we set off and it started to snow. I've just got a T-shirt and some levers on. So the first one, I bought a fleece. Second one, I bought an extra large fleece. <laughs> By the time I got home, I was just a ball of wool. I'd say, oh, it was the worst journey in my life. Anyway, um... I loved riding on the road for the first year, rode on the road, but me being me, I wanted more out of it. And we got to the point at the end of 2006 where a few of us said, this is getting a bit silly. We used to go on rides in groups of about 15, 20, and it used to get a bit leery. And I was only on a 600, some of the guys on a 1,000, and we'd been to a thing called wheelie school. Yes, it exists, where you go to, it was on an airfield, uh, and you can learn to wheelie. So you turn up this place, they teach you how to wheelie, as you can imagine, on the way home, wheeling on the way home, this is on normal roads. With the last part of the run, get off at Junction 15 on the M1, and there's a dual carriageway all the way down into town centre where we are. I looked down at my speed, and I was doing 169 mile an hour, and I was towards the back. And I said, you know what? This is getting stupid. Sooner or later, someone's going to come a cropper. And I decided the following year to go and do a track day. So I went into a track day where you can go and pay to learn to... You know, you ride around a track, pretending you're Valentino Rossi or whoever your, your, your biking hero is, and it's done in a safe environment, as safe as it can be when you're doing 160, 170 plus. And I did a few track days. I did about 12 track days that year and loved it. 2008, I did 47 track days. I went to the California Superbike School, the Ron Haslam Race School, and I entered my first race at the end of 2008. 2009, I started out my own team, and we started doing endurance racing, which is weird for a sprinter, three and six hour races, a bit like a relay. And I've been doing that right up until uh, till, till last season. So when I get into, well, we've won that. We've been, I've been national champion at, 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 at that as well, by the way. 2011 we won. Last year we finished there. Um, 2000, yeah, 2011. And then I went for a stage where I got fed up of just going to the gym and doing the usual stuff. And 
uh, yeah, I enjoyed the bikes, and I was at the gym with my wife, and as I always say to her, I got bored of doing curls for the girls, just, you know, going to the gym and doing the same old, same old. And I wanted to do something different, and my wife used to do quite a lot of kickboxing. And she said, you should go and do some kickboxing. I think you'll love it. I think you'll love the style of training. I think you'll love, you know, everything about it, sparring, all this sort of stuff. Went along in July 2013. Went to this uh, kickboxing gym, joined, enjoyed it. And I thought, I'm going to give myself maybe six months or so, and then I'm going to enter a fight. September 2013, I entered my first fight. Um, made the final, and literally got the stuff in kicked out of me in the final. Um, and you've never seen such a bear with a sore head, not because of what the guy had done to me, but what I was just so disappointed about my performance. So I went back into training, and October that same year was the National Championships in Birmingham. And I went to the National Championships, and I, I entered three different um, competitions in my category. The main one was the, um, what they call the points competition in my weight category, and I ended up winning that and becoming national champion at the tender age of 48, or whatever it was. Um, after only starting in the July. And as I say, the point of telling that is not that I can take my hand to all sorts of sports, as my dad calls me jack of all trades, master of none, um, but it's just the fact that actually if you really want something and you want it bad enough, I personally believe that you can achieve it regardless to who you are, what you are, what you've done and what you haven't done. Most of it is up here. I won most of my fights at that national uh, title at cha championships not from a physical point of view, from, again, a mental point of view, and stuff that I picked up as an athlete. And one of the things that I did, and I'm rattling on, because there's a few questions if you want to do them, is before every fight, because it's a bit like a knockout, literally a knockout competition, if you can knock them out, you get through, um, I would stand on, on the mat, and I would stare the guy in the eye. And none of them in the, all the prelims, all the, pre, uh, the rounds leading up to final, would actually stare at me. So you'd be standing opposite, and they'll all be going, looking anywhere but at me. And the fact that they wouldn't look at me, I knew I'd beaten them. And the only guy who looked at me was the guy that I met in the final. And I remember he looked at me, and he just I looked at him thinking, yeah, I've got you as well. And he looked at me, and in my head I thought, oh, crap. Because <laughs> <laughs> he's actually looked back. And do you know what? I only beat him by one point. And it, it just proved to me that it was a mental side of it. Maybe on that point it might have been just the physical bit and a bit of luck or whatever. But he was the only one that actually looked back and looked confident and, and came in with an air of in invincibility. And it was no surprise that he and I made the final. I'd never met him since, I don't know, but it'd be interesting to profile him and see what he was. So you kind of get into this kind of work, but I'm going to stop there. Um, thanks for listening to me. I hope you enjoyed what I had to say. If you have, my name's Jack Revan. If you haven't, this is Chris Akabusi saying thanks for coming anyway. Um, and if anybody has got any questions... I think there is a couple of microphones around. If you've got a question, stick your hand up. Someone will whiz around with a mic and you can ask away. No? Good. Let's go to the bar. Um, no. <laughs> Nothing anybody wants to ask? Have I, have I rattled on for too long and we're short of time? I've got one. Oh, got one here. Yeah, question. Um, you mentioned about Tony, Tony Hadley, I presume. Yes, Tony Hadley. Not the, the lead singer of Pandel yeah, Ballas. <laughs> Tell me a bit more about, you've talked about the relationship, how important uh, you've mentioned him as important as your mum and dad in knowing you, but just tell me a bit more about how important he has been in your career. Oh, gosh, uh, where can I start with Tony? He is my second dad. I say is because I still have a very good relationship with Tony, uh, and I think testimony to how close we are is in Barcelona, when it was just me, Tony, and my dad, my dad would always kind of walk behind and just let me and Tony walk in front where he was walking to the track or, because he knew we, we needed to, to gel and spend more time together than, you know, than, 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 my, than me and my dad did. Um, Tony was someone who had the ability to read people, uh, whether it was their body language, whether it, uh, he just had this real good knack of, of understanding the athletes that he coached. Um, a negative with Tony, he wore his heart on his sleeve. You knew, I don't know if you know Tony or know... He wears his heart on his sleeve, and if he was happy with you, it was great. If he wasn't, he couldn't hide it. Um, very, he's got a lot of C in his profile. I've actually profiled Tony, and he is, again, dots every I, crosses every T. He looks at everything. He works everything out. He leaves nothing, no stone unturned. But he makes a life of an athlete a lot easier because he does the, almost does the thinking for you and just says, this is all you need to do. Don't worry about why you need to do it. Just go and do it. If you want to know why you need to do it, I'll explain it to you. But this is what will work. And you believe 
Tony, and you know we've had a great relationship. And the first time I asked to be coached by Tony, he actually said no because you're not ready for <coughs> the sort of work that we do. And he explained it to me, and I was like, oh, that's really nice being turned down that way. You know, he turned me down. But then two years later, when we went back and spoke to him, he said, I think you're ready. And he took me on. So he's a real special guy, Tony is. Um, and he has a knack of understanding his, his athletes. Um, I guess the downside of that, we've had a few that's taken the mick out of him and, and really you know, upset him and, and not taken him seriously uh, and almost abused that friendship um, and that what can be seen as kindness, but it's not a weakness. Um, because he can chew you a new one if you uh, if you haven't done what he, he wants to do, and he's done it with me in front of you know in front of people, and you know he's, he, he he understands the way athletes work. So even to this day, I have a great relationship with Tony. I still speak to him a lot. We still talk about athletics. We still um, talk about his athlete. He's got a young athlete who I'm sure you uh, uh, know the name of, uh, whose name just escaped me. Uh, came second in the Commonwealth. Oh God, what's his name? Yeah, young 19-year-old, has no idea how to run a 400, but run 44-7 last year. Um, <laughs> yes, he's got a double marrow name and it's gone. Oh, gosh, I can't think of it. Anyway, it'll come to me when I'm sitting on the loo tonight sometime. <laughs> oh, I remember now. Um, but yes, real, real good talent. And, and Tony's brought him on since a young, you know, since a real young kid. And he's got that same relationship with him. And Tony just gains this respect from all his athletes. And he's quite a quiet, very unassuming man. But yeah, he's... Brilliant, brilliant, brilliant guy. I wish there was more people like him around. Thank you. Any more burning questions? I know we're, Sorry, it's that's been my really fault. really interesting, so I didn't want to stop. Um, so unless there's any burning questions, can I just ask you to show once more what a great time we've had listening to Derek. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.